the CARICOM region. I'm sure that the contributions you will hear this evening will leave us all with food for thought on the state of the CSME's freedom of movement regimes. I wish to express my sincere thanks to the panelists, Ambassador Comichon, Mr. Preville, Ms. Young, Dr. Brathwaite, and our moderator, Mr. Rogers, for being here. And I hope that our viewers enjoy the discussion. Thank you. And our thanks to you, Professor Newton. Glad you could extend such a very special welcome and literally lay the framework for a discussion on the matter of the Caribbean single market and economy. Well, you referred to Ambassador David Comichong. He joins us, but let me tell you exactly who he is. A Caribbean regionalist and Pan-Africanist who now serves as this Barbados ambassador to CARICOM and the Association of Caribbean States. And if you really wanted a, a demonstration of a real Caribbean man, well, he's born in St. Vincent uh, as a result of uh, his father being a, a Methodist traveling minister. Uh, ambassador Comichong received his primary education in Trinidad and his secondary education in Barbados. He holds a Bachelor of Laws degree from the University of the West Indies. He went to Cave Hill and he's been practicing ever since. So we're very pleased to welcome him because he's taken on a very unique role in the furtherance of this single market and economy. Ambassador Komishong. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. And um, thanks to um, Professor Thelma Newton and the Impact Justice um, Project for inviting me. Uh, Julian, there's one thing you didn't say about me, and it's that um, I am something of a Calypsonian. So I, I want to start my um, presentation with um, a Calypso. Um, I'm not going to sing it. You have to, you have to pay to come in the tent to hear me sing it, but I'm going to give you the lyrics. This Calypso is from 1955. 1955, um, the Caribbean, we were in, having discussions with the British Colonial Office about establishing this um, federation, colonial federation. And uh, we were, our political leaders were agitating themselves over this issue of freedom of movement. And so up stepped Attila de Hun, um, Raymond Quevedo, the people's spokesman of Trinidad, and this was his calypso, and I quote, the whole question of federation is meeting with in misinterpretation. The question is freedom of movement and the right of settlement. The whole thing to me is stupidity because we have federation already. Mr. Justice Juke is a demerarian. Justice Camacho, he is a St. A Saint Lucian. Your legal draftsman is an Antiguan, and your attorney general is a Barbadian. In every office of the government, in every avenue of employment, in every government institution, they're holding administrative position. And I can tell you here openly, they even control the press in this colony, end of quote. So here is Attila the Hun expressing a lack of fear of the free movement of Caribbean people. In fact, not only is he not afraid of it, but he positively embraces it and welcomes it. And he does so because he understands that he's dealing with family. It is family coming in. And not only are they family, but they're bringing valuable skills and talents to contribute um, to the Trinidadian colony at, at the time. And, but unfortunately, um, this was very much um, a minority point of view among the um, political elite at the time. And as we know, the Federation foundered on this issue of freedom of movement, with um, one, particularly one of the larger territories being um, very much concerned that there would be a whole set of, of migrants coming from the, the smaller 
and less developed um, West Indian territories. And, um, and, and we know the story. Um, Jamaica came out of the Federation, Trinidad followed suit and the, and the Federation collapsed. So traditionally, there's been this fear of, of freedom of movement of our people, even as we talk about integrating, integrating our region. But freedom of movement is critical to any integration project, especially in a region like the Caribbean. Think about it. What is, what is the quintessence of our Caribbean region? Well, we were the world's first slave societies. What is the fundamental feature of enslavement? It is restriction, lack of movement, lack of the ability to move. And so if we are talking about building a contemporary um, process that helps us to transcend that history, that past of restriction, clearly this concept about giving our people the freedom to move, um, not only in a physical and economic sense, but it has a psychological dimension as well. That must be central um, to our people's experience. But it is something that we have grappled with. Um, when we started after the Federation collapse, we went to Carifta. We did not have it in Carifta. We went to the early iteration of CARICOM in 1973. We did not have it in that early iteration of CARICOM. It was only when we recognized that circumstances were forcing us to move to a single market and single economy that we, 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 took, we took that step of including in our arrangements freedom of movement. But we still put it in, in Article 45 as a goal. In Article 46, we went on to say, look, we are going to um, gradually implement this goal. And we started with um, the Skills National Program. Um, so we're going to discuss the Skills National Program, the Right of Establishment Program, et cetera. But I would just end this opening segment by saying, I believe that we need um, our integration movement needs freedom of movement. We can't have a single market and single economy without it. And we have to reach to the stage where we don't see freedom of, freedom of movement as a desirable luxury to entertain when things are going good, but something to keep at bay um, when, when we have some um, economic difficulties. We must see it as, in fact, integral to our entire developmental process. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And thank you for reinforcing something that many people across this region have said again and again. We still have a federation, so to speak, because all these elements that we referred to and, and Attila referred to back in 1955 are still with us, and we're really still working hard to reinforce the value of. Let's find out exactly where we are, and we're fortunate to have with us Titus Prevel, who is the program manager of the CARICOM single market, and he is at the CARICOM single market and economy unit based in Barbados. He started there back in September of 2020, after having served as a permanent secretary in his native St. Lucia for over 12 years now, he's been in this post. Most of the time he's been permanent secretary in the ministry responsible for trade, industry, commerce, and consumer affairs and you also served in tourism, civil aviation, et cetera. All these portfolios would strike me as being relevant to his current focus as the program manager of CSME. So let's bring Titus in here to give us a sense or a roadmap as exactly where the process stands. Thank you, Julian. Uh, let me also thank Ambassador Commission for his opening statement and also to put on record um, my sincere thanks to the Impact Justice Project and to uh, um, Professor Newton for her comments earlier on. Um, well, Julian, we will get deeper into the roadmap as to where we are, but I just want to, to move from the point made by uh, Ambassador Commission, where he started to lay the groundwork for the rationale for free movement 
of persons within an arrangement such as what we have called CARICOM, um, and more particularly the CSME. Uh, and, and to say that when we talk of the CSME, what it is we're trying to do. So we would have had uh, arrangements for regional integration going far, as far back as um, the post-1962 the post, uh, period after the collapse of the Federation. We would have had in 1968 the establishment of CARIFTA, and of course in 73 we saw the, 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 the deepening of the economic relations, as it were, to move um, into a customs union with the development and establishment of CARICOM. Now, the, the CSME, as, as Ambassador Commission was, was, was um, intimating, was one step further in the iteration that takes us into what we call a, a single economic space. It's a, a, it's a step deeper than a customs union. And under the customs union, we had the, a common external tariff. We had um, the establishment of rules of origin to ensure that goods traded within the region would not attract any duties except for those we make exceptions for. And we, in, 19, in 2001, we decided to have this revised treaty established with something called the CARICOM Single Market and Economy. And this was a response to the global circumstances of, of course, the WTO having been established in 95. And we had happening around us um, the establishment of a number of trading blocks, including um, NAFTA. So as a natural response, the heads in 1989 at Granance in Grenada moved into uh, uh, and gave impetus to the establishment of the CSME. And it is premised on the, the rationale that as a region, if we were to build sufficient economic capacity and economic efficiency and therefore competitiveness, we would better be able to compete with what was happening around us globally as one. And two, we would begin the process of changing the economic structures of our economy, which were largely dependent on trade between ourselves and the rest of the world, and hardly within, within ourselves. And also, it was meant to address the issue of building resilience among ourselves. So we would have created a greater domestic space. And in there, we would have want, wanted to see the establishment of businesses and economic activity. But for that to happen, one of the key factors of production, which is labor, had to be able to move freely. Um, the CSM is premised on the free movement of capital, goods, services, the right of any CARICOM national to establish a business in any sector, and very importantly, on the whole issue of the right of, of people to move. And so we could not have an economic space, a single space, seeking to build efficiency, grow a market, if the factor of production called labor could not move. And therefore, this is really what drives the whole idea of the movement of skilled labor, as Article 46 of the Revised Treaty uh, speaks to. So what have we done? Um, in our attempt to build a single economic space for the production of goods and services, we have seen that the CARICOM Secretariat and the community, in fact, established a CSME unit in Barbados. And this year would be um, next year will be 20 years since the CSME unit has been established in Barbados with the primary purpose of being nearer to the people. Uh, so so the, the whole idea of the CSME unit as itself was one step by that, that the community took in making the matters of CARICOM appear closer to, to the common man, the common man and woman. We have seen that the, the, the secretariat for the CSME unit um, has established um, social security arrangements for uh, the movement as people move around the region. We have seen the creation of institutions such as CrossQ, the CARICOM Development Fund, the CARICOM Competition Commission, the CCG. And all these have been established in part to treat with the single economic space we're talking about. So movement of people must be seen, and I refer here specifically to the movement of skilled CARICOM nationals, must be seen in the context of a critical role that that category of the factor of production plays in the development and, and widening 
of our our um, economic enterprises in the region. So I will stop here for now, Julian, and we will have more discussion on that. And I come, I go back to you um, at this point. And as promised, your roadmap. But I like the way that you frame the discussion uh, for that we will have later on by really focusing on the matter of the creation of that single domestic space. I think that really is a very important message to share with people. Let's turn our attention now to the legal elements here. And this is where I'll invite Gladys Young to join us. She is an attorney at law with expertise in international law and regional integration. She currently serves as the senior legal advisor, officer that is, of the CARICOM Secretariat, responsible for the CSME. She holds a master's in law and international economic law, a Juris Doctor, and a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science. Quite a combination, but all relevant to helping us better understand and forge, of course, the critical legal elements regarding the CSME. Welcome, Gladys Young. Thank you, Julian. And um, I would also like to express my thanks to Professor Newton and Impact Justice and UE and UETV for organizing this um, excellent um, panel discussion today. I would just like to build a little bit on what Titus was also saying in terms of the um, single market, in terms of in, in relation to my introductory remarks, and just to speak, speak generally that um, the whole purpose of this is to improve the lives of our people and future generations in CARICOM. And I would like to focus this part of the discussion on the benefits of the CSME, the role in terms of the rules-based framework that has been created by the revised treaty and the role of the Caribbean Court of Justice in that, as well as the importance for CARICOM nationals and users of the CARICOM single market and economy to know their rights and their obligations. And so when we speak of benefits of the CSME, a lot of times it gets lost and it, you know, the focus sometimes may just be on business or on government, but the fact is there are benefits of the CSME for business, for labor, for consumers. Um, and when we speak about movement of people, it is you know, in relation to labor, consumers, persons that are consuming services as well as um, as, as well as providing services and of course benefits to government and you know some of that in terms of for business would include um, the expanded market for goods and services the fact that you have a, a larger natural resource base a larger workforce um, from which to pool um, or, or to gather all of these skills and of course growth in terms of being able for businesses to be able to merge um, with other businesses and to be able to to do joint procurement which i'm sure when we discussing uh, when we're discussing further we'd be able to speak to some of the areas that we have developed and and in relation to labor you have the increase increases in skills in terms of what has been what has been provided the focus on um, human resource development, but also you have a larger employer base from which to get your, um, from which to, to, for, for labor to be able to seek to move. You additionally have greater sustainability because you have a larger pool contributing to your social security systems. And then of course there are benefits that are, there are added benefits in terms of the contingent rights that have been have been developed and and rights that your that your additional rights that your spouses as well um, have gotten as a result of of your being able to move as a as a skilled national or a service provider or a, a person establishing and then of course for consumers you have the greater greater choice the fact that you have um, greater protection, harmonized laws in relation to consumer protection. And we have established a CARICOM rapid alert system for dangerous non-food consumer goods. And um, it has been a system that allows for general consumer complaints as well to be able to move through. And, and of course, for government, um, in addition to that, you have increased efficiencies, um, pooled resources in terms of certain CARICOM institutions that are able to, to, to do work, just like we have with the CARFA. 
and um, the Car uh, sorry, Caribbean Regional Public Health Agency that has been in integral to what has been happening with COVID-19. And then, um, you know, a greater revenue base in terms of when you have persons moving, you also are able to collect in relation to, to things like that. But more importantly, and I, I wanted to focus the, this part to just speak to the fact that through the revised treaty, we have created this rules-based framework and it provides a level of certainty, predictability. Um, and through some of these judgments, we've also um, had greater inclusivity in relation to what we are doing at the, at the CARICOM level. And we have provided avenues to address challenges experienced, including um, challenges to the Caribbean Court of Justice so that we've gotten quite a bit of guidance from the court in the continued operation of the system and the community and the secretariat in, um, through the, the secretariat representing the community has also played a role in, in these cases in terms of not just in where the communities are defendant, but also in the supply of information and in, in making submissions that are for the benefit of the community. And we have had from the court's guidance, we have been able to further develop and reform our procedures in CARICOM. We have reformed procedures in relation to the common external tariff and, and um, applications for suspension. We have established procedures specifically in relation to refusal of entry, which came out of um, the judgment of the court. We have um, also been able to further the work that is being done to harmonize and um, simplify procedures in relation to movement of skills and services coming out of some of the um, dicta from the court. And we have had the move where we are now publishing decisions of the conference. Those are on the CARICOM website. Um, we have more work to do, but we are, we have already started publication of decisions. We have greater inclusivity in terms of the private sector, labor and civil society being engaged um, at various levels, also at the levels of the organs and at the level of the conference in particular. And, um, you know, it is, it, I should note that that the fact that we have a rules-based system, the fact that we have had these um, judgments shows that persons are using the system, that they are using the CSME, and that we are able to, be, to benefit from persons seeking to, to um, ensure that, they, that their rights are, are, that they're able to exercise their rights. And I would just like to, highlight the importance and, and end here in terms of the importance of knowing rights. Knowledge is power. And it is important for all users of the system, um, com community nationals and, and business in general, to know the rights and obligations um, in relation to the CARICOM single market and economy and in relation to um, the free movement of persons, it is important for government officials to also know those rights and obligations, and they do, but it's important for users of the CSME to know and understand those rights. And that is why public awareness and public education is key to ensuring that we are able to um, have the, that, that, that people know their rights, that people are able to exercise their rights and that they know the obligations that come with the various rights that they have and that it is important not just that the Secretariat continue the initiative in terms of the community but that member, state, member states also take up the mantle and ensure that they are doing continuous public awareness initiatives in this regard. I'll turn over Julian um, at this time so that you can, um, and we can go back into further discussion later in terms of some of the specifics. Thank you very much, Gladys Young. Of course, the legal legal, so to speak. Uh, we got the benefit of her input and much more to come. Let's turn our attention now to introducing Dr. George Braffitt, 
who is a political science scientist and analyst with a, obviously a, an interest in regional integration and security matters. Uh, and he's described his specialty as Caribbean thought and Caribbean political economy, among other topics. He gained his uh, BSc and, and MPhil in political science from the University of the West Indies and his PhD in international politics from Newcastle University. And during those PhD studies, he focused his thesis on the politics of migration within CARICOM, particularly the free movement of community nationals in Barbados. So he's got a particular perspective that would be very interested in our discussion today. Dr. George Braffitt, welcome. Good evening, and thank you very much, um, Julian, for that warm welcome. I'd like to also thank Professor Newton and the Impact Justice Program. Uh, and I would like to thank the University of the West Indies for playing such a formative role in this panel discussion this evening, which I think is quite instrumental and timely. From the perspectives already produced, uh, Ambassador Commission laying out uh, in terms of a, a brief historic development to the point that we've come through, decolonization, CURFTA, CARICOM, and now we have the CSME, and we're looking to even advance on that. To the point made by Ms. Um, Titus, where Titus spoke in terms of the domestic space and, and, and those challenges and those reasons why we had to navigate carefully, particularly as we want to encourage all the factors of production to be moving in a direction positive for the people of the region. And then for Gladys, for really putting out there the type of lenses that you can perceive and see the benefits for the people of the region. I think th those are really important platforms. Agreeing with all that was, was, is said, I wanna start by going back to some a statement from one of the pioneers of our regional movement and the post-independent vintage. And that is His Excellency Earl Walton Barrow who acknowledged that the collective wisdom of the region's people is of high value. And unless the peoples of the region understand the purpose of all regional institutions, integration will become a more difficult process, progress. We have it in our hands and I'm seeing, regardless of the indigenous or exogenous forces that compound us, because we will always be faced with challenges but we also recognize that we have opportunities. And it is in that vein that I really want to say that migration is fundamental to the human condition and of benefit not only to migrants, but also to sending and host countries. And within our collective wisdom in the region, this is something that we have to understand, that migration is part of life. And within the context of our CSME, I know it is a hot button topic, but I've been engaging in terms of with the member states, individual member states, and in, in my capacity as a consultant for the CSME. And I have been able to discern that we are sometimes floored by myths. We are sometimes attached to tradition, but oftentimes, we prefer not to put the gaze on the object. And if we put the gaze on the object this afternoon, then I would want to say that there, during the course of the next two, two hours or less than two hours now, there are many things that I will share with you. I will suggest that one of the things that comes up all the time is an implementation deficit within CARICOM. And I would say that is something that can be overcome. It is overcome by political will and leadership at the top. But at the bottom, it is, it is strengthened when we understand what Barrow was speaking about, when he was speaking about the collective wisdom. It was meaning, it, 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 
suggest giving everyone meaning from where they are and being able to lift up where you can and to push up as you go forward and push forward. I'm suggesting that the fears of some say carrying capacity, some say institutional capacity, some prefer to, to, to limit themselves and can only see in terms of what had happened before. I had a population of 80,000. It has only gone to 85,000 over the last 40 years. And I'm comfortable with that. But no, no. We have now been given expression that we can account for in a realistic term. And that is the experience since March of 2020 in terms of COVID-19 and our responses. Something that was novel, new, and dangerous and has actually emerged as perhaps alongside climate change as the greatest threat facing our regions. And this is precisely why now more than ever, we have to give reason for the people to be able to move, to add to that domestic space in terms of movement, in terms of skill, in terms of cross fertilization of the rich and diverse cultures that exist within the region, and to give essence and show the globe that we can depend on many of our endogenous, endogenous forces to deal with exogenous problems. And I'm saying now is the time for free movement. We cannot wait to go to Bridgetown or Kingstown or, or any other town in this region if we are waiting for all the stoplights to change and give green. We have to move now. Now is the time. And we know, we have already established, we did not do it after the 2008 economic hurricane that hit us in the region. So hence, there seem among the people that we became slightly more insular, but we did it in terms of the last year, in terms of how we shared resources, how we responded, how we communicated with each other, virtually and otherwise. And I'm saying all of these things, when compacted into that collective wisdom that Arab Bar was speaking about, forms the foundation and the basis for our, us to advance free movement so it becomes a reality not for some but for all and i am willing i will hand over to you here julian there's certainly a lot more that i can say but i just wanted to put the context in from from where i speak where i'm looking at the collective wisdom institutional and the institutions and process in terms of building them to gain momentum and to push us as far as we can reach the sky is the limit for us in the region. Over to we're going to take that. We're going to take that passion, George, and share it all around this region. And is at this stage that I want to bring back uh, Titus Prevel here because I know you promised me a roadmap, but I want to fashion it, Titus, on the basis that there's a sense that in some quarters that we haven't made any progress. But I think you're in a you you're in a unique position to exactly lay out for us and say, hey. This is where we've reached in the process. These are the clear benefits that have come to many people who've taken advantage of this freedom of movement. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Julian. Um, and let me thank George for the passion with which he has <laughs> expressed um, uh, himself this afternoon. What have we achieved so far with respect to um, free movement and the benefits of the free movement um, regime. The data does not show that our people are taking advantage of the uh, arrangements with respect to the um, right of establishment or even uh, uh, pursuit of job opportunities in the region um, under the skills regime. The data is not showing that. 
But what, what is it that we've done to ensure people have the possibility of using those opportunities? Well, first of all, you would have seen from a uh, number of decisions from the heads of government that we have arrangements that treat with how skill certificates ought to be processed at the member state level to ensure that when people move, they move with a right. And the notion of discrimination and subjectivity is taken out of the door because as a skill CARICOM national, with your skill certificate, you have certain rights. So in terms of looking at the roadmap and what has happened so far, one of the most critical elements of our arrangement arrangement so far has been the, the, the efforts that have been made to ensure domestic legislation in each member state has been, the legislation has been amended to treat with issues that would have infringed um, national treatment or what we might call discriminatory elements in our legislation that, that could have been used to discriminate on the basis of nationality what one national CARICOM national would have in one member state when the person would have. So we've done a lot of work to treat with the legislation that we would have found in each other member state, each, each member state as discriminatory. So that's a, a critical element to, grave, to give um, predictability to the system. And then we have looked at the administrative procedures that we have laid out with respect to what ought to happen. And we've sought to harmonize those administrative procedures so that there is consistency in treatment of CARICOM nationals as they move from one member state to the other in the exercise of their right to seek employment or the right to establish. Now, there are still some um, difficulties with some member states where the legislation has not been amended or there are practices and procedures which are at variance with the decisions that the heads have taken on that matter. That is being treated with continuously, but even more now. Uh, Julian, I must tell you that as we speak, we are in the process of engaging member states on a one-on-one on -one, -on -one basis, seeking to get from them what are some of the key constraints and reasons why some of the arrangements and decisions that the heads have taken, uh, and decisions that would have impacted free movement, why have these not been implemented at the member state level? And this is in an effort to ensure that in short time, in, in as short a space of time as possible, each member state of this community would have done the necessary amendments to their legislation and put in place the administrative procedures that have been recommended and agreed to by the heads so that we have predictability and certainty in treatment as people move from one member state to the other. So in terms of the roadmap with respect to um, ensuring we have consistency of treatment of CARICOM nationals, we are in the process right now of looking at how we could roll out a program of action that once agreed to by the member states would lead to greater involvement of a wider base of the community in terms of uh, each, at each member state level, wider discussion, wider consultation within the NGO community, with the youth, with all groups in the development of policies that, are, that find themselves being discussed and approved at the level of the heads or the different organs of the community. Because what we've discovered and we found, Julian, is that there seem to be uh, sometimes um, decisions being taken at the level of the organs, but at the level of the member state, there seem to be a disconnect. And we, 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 we've, we've looked at that, we've studied that, and one of the key reasons for that we have discovered is the lack of consultation that takes place at the member state. So we're looking at these areas in terms of ensuring that when decisions are made at the level of the organs of the community, that these decisions are implemented. And that, again, gives greater certainty to the movement of CARICOM nationals once the, the measure is a measure that impacts uh, CARICOM nationals. 
Uh, I'll give you an, another example, Julian. We, we have a, a online platform and system um, called the CAPS, the CARICOM Application Processing System. It's a system that was developed to ensure that when a CARICOM national, um, in the exercise of his right to move as a skilled national, would have applied for a skill certificate in a member state. The whole idea was that this would be done um, in the member state electronically. And th that information would have found itself um, in a repository within the secretariat. And any other member state could have simply looked up uh, a particular national when that national presents himself at, at that other country, that other member state, and would have seen all the information there and would be able to verify that the skill certificate being presented is in fact a, a genuine one. But this system has not been used, for instance. And we are seeking to correct that, to ensure we, we do everything possible so that CARICOM nationals get the benefit of being able to move in the region with greater certainty, greater predictability. So I, I give you a sense in terms of process. Um, the process has involved uh, establishment of the legal procedures, removal of discriminatory procedures, um, putting in place administrative arrangements that are harmonized to give predictability. And also we have put in place measures where nationals who feel aggrieved in their treatment when exercising their rights in member states have a recourse where they could literally put down and, 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 and submit what their concerns are to um, um, in a process that allows the focal points of the various member states to be able to collect these and these can come to the secretariat so we could analyze and then undertake um, uh, measures um, to, to address these. So this gives you a sense of how the community which includes the Secretariat and the member states are approaching the matter of movement of nationals to give greater predictability in the region. You raise a number of questions, but I'll, I'll save them and uh, add them to the list of people who are already sending questions uh, to us via the Facebook page. But let me bring the politician in here, uh, Ambassador Komishong. I know you've been in this post for a short time. I know your passion, I know your history, and I want to ask you if you're surprised to hear that there are so many elements or the mechanisms that are still now being assembled to respond to the challenges of implementation. Uh, Julian, I have the advantage of having been an attorney at law that dealt with immigration matters in Barbados for many years. And um, when when Titus says that um, the skills national, the, the freedom of movement mechanisms within the revised Treaty of Chagaramas are not being used uh, or not being um, very, very much used. Uh, first of all, let's be very clear. The Treaty of Chagaramas sets out that all member states are committed to the goal of free, a full freedom of movement but that this goal is going to be achieved incrementally. So it starts with um, the Skills National Program. Initially, that Skills National Program was only four categories of skills. It's now been increased over the years until it is, it is 12 categories. And you also have the Right of Establishment Program, which is the right to move, to set up a business, or to set oneself up in, in self-employment. Now. Now, Titus is right that um, many CARICOM nationals are not moving under these programs. However, every year in Barbados, there, there are literally thousands of CARICOM nationals who move under the work permit regime. They apply for short-term, long-term work permits. There are also many who move illegally, quote-unquote who are undocumented migrants. I have taken in literally hundreds of undocumented um, CARICOM migrants in Barbados to the immigration department to try to get their status um, sorted out. And all those years, Julian, when I was doing this, and, 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 and these undocumented migrants, scared, um, 
full of trepidation going going into the uh, mission department and I had very little knowledge over those years of the existence of the Skills National Program. And no doubt, those, on, those, those CARICOM nationals who had come to Barbados and simply overstayed their time and, 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 and sought out quote unquote illegal work and were here for well over five years because you had to be here for five years before if you were undocumented you were given you were given the opportunity to come into the immigration and make your case to them and 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 hope that you could be um recognized but the point is the point is caricom has not caricom and when i say caricom i don't just mean the secretariat or the csme unit i mean the member states as well and all of the institutions caricom has not done a good job at promoting um these um, free movement programs that, that it has and making the Caribbean people aware of them. And I am telling you, if these, if these programs were properly promoted, a lot of CARICOM citizens who opted to move, quote unquote, illegally, simply to come and overstay, they, they could easily have uh, um, qualified for those programs or even if they didn't qualify at, at, at the outset, done what was required within their home country to qualify um, um, for those programs and be able to move legally and, and with peace of mind, um, et cetera, or not to have to go to try to move via the work permit route. Because the truth is the Skills National Program, the Right of Establishment Program is superior, is a superior program to the work pro permit program. First of all, if you move as a, if you move under the Skills National Program, you have your CARICOM, you get your CARICOM skills certificate, um, you get an indefinite reside and work status. Um, you don't have to pay for work permits. You don't have to be renewing work permits um, um, every, every couple of years. And your spouse, or your dependent children, or even if you have dependent parents, they get the right to move as well. And they get um, a number of rights within the, the, the CARICOM country that you have moved to. So I'm saying, I'm saying, um, uh, I, okay, my fundamental point is that freedom of movement is a good that should be given to our people. I, I am not even I am not even tying it down um, to any economic argument. I'm saying over and and be and above um, concepts of economics that as a formerly enslaved people who have come out of a historical situation of the dep the deprivation of our freedom of of the of of having been deprived of the ability to move having been restricted that we should want to give to our people um, this benefit this this idea that you are not restricted if you if you are if you're born in St Kitts Nevis you're not restricted to this um, 100 square mile territory and somebody there to tell you you stay there unless somebody gives you permission to leave that um, 100 square mile territory no we want to give our people that psychological freedom. This whole region is yours. It belongs to you to move, to explore, to look for life of, um, and career opportunities. So that's a given. Um, but we haven't gone, we, we have said that we're gonna do it incrementally. And I accept that it is also an economic good. That, that single market that we are developing via this freedom of movement program. It is an economic good. It is, it is in our best economic benefit as, as, as a nation, as, as, a, as a region, um, but we have to develop it. We have to further develop it. And we have most of all to promote it to our people so that they know about it and they can take, um, make full use of it. Thank you, Ambassador. 
you really laid the groundwork now for me to bring Gladys Young back in here because I think you have an opportunity to articulate some of the points you're making earlier in terms of rights. And with David's focus on the labor aspect of all of this, I think it's only right for you to just spell this out for people who really don't quite understand. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. And yes, it is important. Um, David would have spoken, Ambassador would have spoken about the, the skills regime in terms of movement of skilled labor and also in terms of establishment. And it's also important to, um, to emphasize the fact that persons can move temporarily to provide services as well. So in terms of skills, there are 12 categories of skills that are eligible to move under the treaty. There are two categories that we're still um, finalizing in relation to the agricultural workers and security guards. But we have to, um, the other 10 that have been settled, um, settled which include um, university graduates, artists, artisans with a CARICOM, Caribbean vocational qualification, household domestics with a Caribbean vocational qualification, um, media workers, sports persons, teachers, nurses, um, or I should say non-university non graduate nurses and non-university graduate teachers. Um, and I'm sure I have missed one or two. But the fact is, you have a wide range of uh, persons with associate degrees. You have a wide range of categories that are able to move. And of course, our musicians. You have a wide range of categories able to, to move under the skills regime itself. And the skills regime, um, you know, Ambassador was talking about the, the you know, persons that would, would go for the skills certificate, and, and, and likely so. But I can tell you that um, it has been, that Barbados has made strides in simplifying its skills regime um, in terms of the issuance of the skills certificate. And that is something that we are urging and, and trying to get other member states to do when we initially started this process, we would have started it on the basis, it was what, in the 1996, 97, that we started with the university graduates and then went on. So it would have been a, a time where it was unknown. Um, there, were, there were fears. Um, as Titus has indicated, those fears have not been materialized. Um, but also, the, so, so the regime that was set up if you look at it now in 2021, it's cumbersome in terms of some of the things that were being required. Um, and as we would have um, seen in the Tomlinson judgment, Maurice Tomlinson versus Belize and Trinidad and Tobago, where the court, when, when speaking of Maurice Tomlinson, Tomlinson as a skilled national, recognized him as a skilled national as of right, because he had the requisite qualifications, even though he had not applied for a skill certificate. So we recognize and, and we've been trying to emphasize to member states that the skill certificate provides a level of evidence, uh, but it's a, it's a right that nationals have once they meet the criteria. And so it is important to ensure that the process is simple so that, member, so that the nationals can exercise their rights. Um, I would just like to speak briefly in terms of the Caribbean vocational qualification to just indicate that that is a, um, it's a technical qualification, a technical vocational qualification that um, there was a recognition that not everybody would necessarily have, uh, you know, academic qualifications, but that there, there are categories of workers that are essential that would require some sort of um, qualification to show that they've meet, met a particular standard or skill, um, skill level um, in terms of movement. And so the Caribbean vocational qualification does that. And um, there are certain categories, as we've said, artisans with a Caribbean, Caribbean vocational qualification, as well as household domestics with a qual Caribbean vocational qualification. And the information is, is there. We need to, we, Ambassador is correct. We need to make that information much more accessible. But to indicate, one, that those categories can move. Two, the movement is that you would initially get six months um, when, when you arrive. 
if you already have the skill certificate in hand, then you get six months and you are ready, you're allowed to work immediately, but you're supposed to also make sure that the relevant authority in the receiving country sees the, the, the skills qualification and, and that, that authority has a right to do certain verification exercises by contacting the, author, the, the issuing state, the, the country that issued the skills certificate, they, are supposed, they can contact that country's authority and make sure that, they, you know, that the skills certificate is properly issued and if they want to check the, the documentation, they can do so but by contacting the issuing authority. And that is one of the things that we've seen where member states still are, um, in many cases, asking the nationals to bring in the qualifications. The argument being that sometimes the issuing authority takes long, but then that needs to be addressed bilaterally rather than asking a national where you do not have the right to ask that national. And that's what we talk about in terms of nationals understanding their rights as well as member state officials understanding what the rights and the obligations are. Um, once you, once that um, has been, once that process has been completed and the member state um, has also the right in terms of the immigration side of it um, where the member state can issue, well the member state has to issue indefinite stay to a skilled national. Uh, but of course, the member state can check in relation to the security aspect of that, because if the security, if, you know, if there are certain security questions or, or concerns, then the member state would have certain um, rights that it could exercise in that regard. Um, but the skilled national and ambassador is right. The skills regime, the right of establishment, you get indefinite stay or you're supposed to get indefinite stay um, if you're exercising your rights under that. Your spouse is also supposed to get indefinite stay and your dependent children and as he indicated, even your, your dependent parents under the contingent rights protocol. And what is important is that um, we, we, we have to keep asking why is it that that, that persons are not using the system. And as I said, part of it is that we did make that system a bit cumbersome. And part of it is in relation to establishment that um, some will say that it's easier to get a work permit, which means that we do have work to do um, at the member state level and, and the community as a whole to make the system um, such that that is the system that is more attractive because it should never be that it's easier to get a work permit than it is to move on the, the CARICOM single market and economy. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, Dr. George Bradford, let me bring you back in here because having done your thesis on this matter of migration, um, do you have to go back and update it now? <laughs> I, I, missed, I missed part of the question, Julian, I don't know why. I, I was, I saying that having done your thesis on this matter uh -huh. of migration, what you're hearing here may require you to update it. Uh, indeed, uh, there are portions of it that, that, that I, should, I should pull out, um, particularly in two things. One, the way we speak to each other in terms of CARICOM brothers and sisters. So it's a discourse and uh, how we allow popular discourse sometimes to dismantle the very things that we are building to deepen integration. So that's one. And the second one speaks to the very notion of the very institutions and processes for moving us forward to the point that sometimes we doubt ourselves. And as a former deputy prime minister suggested to me a few years ago in an interview, sometimes it seems as though Caribbean people want to people under themselves. Prime Minister Arthur said a few years ago in a speech, the CSME will be but one part of a wider integration movement in the Caribbean. It will essentially mirror the state of Caribbean society and psyche. And I think we need to understand that. 
a test or capacity to conceive of that which simply must be done in pursuit of a higher level of development and our will to see things through. It cannot be implemented by a region that doubts itself. That is part of the collective wisdom and looking at the institutions and the processes for which just now Gladys gave a fantastic review in terms of the implications um, regarding the law and the benefits and the rights. Indeed, I will add at this point in time to that discussion, particularly at the member state level, two things. One, there needs to be greater interministerial and interagency collaboration. It is highly important. We have to ensure that all of our stakeholders know what is going on. And hence, the backlash that sometimes comes in terms of media or the lack of accuracy as projected through media that allow things to formulate would not occur. For example, uh, we know particularly uh, as the individual states arrive uh, in what they call the uh, the crazy cycle where you know election is coming up, and then you make migration and labor mobility political statements, and there are distortions that are not conducive to state building nation building or integrated development and it is it is when we sit back and relax and realize that we have to bring the all the departments all the stakeholders at the that governmental level need to know what is going on but at the same point in time it is the media because it's how the media reports what is happening within caricom that will convince others it is how the media sees their role so I think perhaps one of the things as we go forward, certainly in the next six months to the next year, we have to find a way to bring the media greater on board with actualities rather than depending on myths and emotions. And in taking myths and emotions out of it, we have to find ways to let people know that the greater evidence has suggested whether you're looking at it in terms of remittances, the, the cross fertilization of skills, um, what a country gains in terms of bringing into that, to the receiving state, and what the sending state gains, not just in terms of the remittances, but in terms of the networking that goes on that are actually um, conduits to greater mobilization of commercial and, and, and entrepreneurial activities. So it, we miss out on so many things. One, by not having accurate information in terms of, and I know that with the labor market information system um, setting to have a, a, a rebirth, so to speak, I am confident that accurate information built there, timely information built there, and with the lessening of restrictions and prohibitive measures, these are things that will facilitate our regional development. So we don't have to worry about a brain drain if all of these resources are kept within the context of our domestic space. We have to worry about it when they go to the United States and United Kingdom or Canada or wherever else in the world and sometimes become reluctant to return. So it is from that looking at it in terms yes we've done it in phased fashion but how do we build the institutional capacity now how do we build and strengthen the informational and communication networks to the point that greater stakeholders see greater buy-in and there's accuracy of data and information that people understand that labor mobility within the context of the region makes us collectively more competitive and at the same point in time allows member states to have greater win-win situations in this real world where we are faced with so many exogenous forces not knowing where they're coming from and not knowing how they will impact on us over to you julian thank you thank you professor 
What I'm going to do now is, is start uh, sharing some of the questions posed by our viewers, uh, whether they're watching us on UETV Global or they're following on Facebook. And I tell you, the, the questions are coming in fast and furious. I'm going to try and group a couple of them together because a, a few of them are related in, in such. But I think one of the things coming out here very strongly, and I want to get a response uh, from, from one of you as I pose the question, it would seem to a number of the questioners that there's a sense that the CSME is not a fully functioning entity and that there is some timetable to get it to what it really should be. Is that a particularly interesting perspective to take? Uh, let, me, let me ask Titus to come in here because you're in the heart of the, of the engine room, so to speak, in the CSME unit. Yes. This is a fair question, Julian. Um, is the CSME still a working progress? Most certainly it is a working progress, simply because all member states have not done all that needs to be done to have their systems internally in a manner that all their nationals see the CSME as a natural part of the development. Very importantly, and Dr. George made some very important points. You see, the CSME has and not just a CSME, CARICOM in, uh, on the whole, but the CSME in particular, has been treated as one additional thing that countries, the member states of CARICOM, have to attend to from time to time. It is not seen as part of the natural planning infrastructure of the member states for their own national development. I, I say so, uh, maybe I should say, it, may, it does not appear to be seen that it is part of the national planning process. If we, if we look at what the CSM is meant to do, it's meant to cause, in the main, increased economic activity in each member state, but among member states. Now, if that is to happen, governments need to promote the CSME as part of their national strategies. In other words, are we going to use, and I take a, a very simple one, and the, the LDCs of CARICOM um, uh, will associate with that very easily. There is something called Article 164. It is meant under the treaty to give the less developed countries of CARICOM an opportunity to build certain sectors um, or industries in the country by um, uh, providing certain advantages to certain sectors vis-a-vis -vis, uh, other member states of CARICOM and other countries of the world. Now, this is part of your industrial policy. The, the, the Article 164 is part of the industrialization policy for the um, LDCs of CARICOM. So what should happen? We should have in those member states as part of your Ministry of Commerce as part of your Ministry of Economic Planning, specific targets that you would like certain industries to reach by uh, taking advantage of, this, of the Article 164. It, so, so it is as integral as that. The, the CSME should be seen, as we speak now, we, we, we're still in the midst of a pandemic. Member states agree that this pandemic is an external or an exogenous shock. It has affected countries all countries of CARICOM, but the, the tourism countries have, affected, have been affected even disproportionately more. So the question is, should we not be using the arrangements we have, that we have created for ourselves as a vehicle to reposition our member states' economic structures so that we are more closer integrated, that we depend on each other a lot more, we bind ourselves to each other a lot more. So when an external shock comes, we're able to weather it because our economies would have been a little more diversified. That, that we, we, we are diversified around certain, certain key industries such as tourism, but our diversification includes the building of other sectors that focus on arrangements among ourselves. So yes, we need to address the issues at the member state level. The member state level, we need to have dedicated institutions that survive individual persons over time. And those institutions must be integral in the national 
planning process, not as an adjunct. The, the, the CSME must not be an adjunct to national planning in CARICOM. It must be center, it must be central. Thirdly, information dissemination. Absolutely correct. Um, enough is not being done or has not been done at the level of CARICOM to inform on the CSME. But the real, the real difficulty is that at the member state level, the citizens of the community have not had the benefit of sufficient information from the, the governments about the CSME so that those community nationals, whether they be businesses or individuals, they are not being, they are not making the demand on the governments for actions to, in, to ensure the CSME is fully implemented. Governments are demand driven, but people only make demand if they understand what is there to make the demand on. So you, 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 we really have a situation where we need greater public education at the member state level, driven by the member states, co-opting the CARICOM secretariat and what we have in there to support the member states to cause greater understanding. And this is not, this cannot be a one-time activity. It must be ongoing because generations change over time and things change over time. So this is where I, 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 I what I want to say at this point, I'm Julian on the matter. All right. Thank, thank you, uh, Titus. Let me let me share another question, and this time I want to ask Ambassador to respond to this. Um, who says there's a gap between the academic, intellectual level and the political? Uh, politicians and some policy implementation often do not act in good faith. Now, you're ambassador to CARICOM and the ACS. Uh, is that your experience, I mean, at this stage? Or is it that we really need an overhaul of this process? Um, well, um, Julian, if we are focusing on freedom of movement, I, I think that um, all, all the politicians would tell you that the single market and single economy are good ideas that they, that they subscribe to. Um, the single market is basically about the movement of the free movement of the factors of, of production. So movement of goods, selling, selling goods to each other across the, the region without customs duties and taxes and restrictions, movement of capital, movement of business, um, and, and, uh, and supposedly movement of workers, of, of people. The single economy now takes it to another level. The single economy says um, you have to even go beyond that. You have to do that, but you also have to, if you're going to have a single economy where you are, you are orchestrating and planning production on a regional, on a regional basis and building um, regional industries, you're going to have to also harmonize um, your policies, government policies, tax policy, um, regulations, your your legislation pertaining to business activity and, and so forth. Um, I should say that we have obviously done, we have done more in relation to the single market than we have done in relation to the single economy. So we are still, you know, lagging. It, with, we are lagging with, with aspects of both, both single market, and single economy, we are lagging obviously more with, with the single economy issues. This, if, if we achieve the single economy, we will end up um, in all likelihood with a single um, CARICOM currency, a single CARICOM dollar. So we are, we are still some distance off. But getting back to the question now, the virtually all um, government leaders will tell you that the single market and the single economy are good things, positive things. But if pressed on the issue of freedom of movement, um, they will hedge their bets. The attitude will tend to be that, yes, freedom of movement is a good thing, but only when things are going good. So it's almost as if it's a, it's a luxury to be had when you know things are going good and it can and it can be accommodated and i think the breakthrough we need to make we need to get we need to make this breakthrough where people see 
um, the freedom of movement, not as a luxury to be accommodated in good times, but as a critical component to any economic development program that makes any sense. Um, uh, and, and until we make that, that breakthrough in, 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 in how we conceive of it, we are going to have this diffidence. So the diffidence is there, even in terms of um, how we're approaching it now, where we are saying we commit to the goal, but we're going to take it step by step incrementally. Now, we haven't said that in relation to a movement of capital or movement of businesses. We have said we're going to implement those at one fell swoop. But when it comes to our people, we are saying, hey, we got to take this thing. Um, we got to be very careful with this thing. We got to do it um, bit by bit. So I think we really have to make that um, conceptual um, breakthrough that um, it is integral to any economic development program that makes sense that people should be able to move should be able to move freely it is not it is not something to fear if you approach it from the perspective of Attila the Hun or you approach it from the perspective of a pan-Africanist or real pan-Caribbeanist that believe that we are all kip and kin that we are in fact brothers and sisters that the slave ship came across the Atlantic, it stopped at Barbados, dropped off some, it went a little further, dropped off a few others in Grenada and up, up, up to Jamaica, that we are one people. If you have that understanding of us, you will not fear freedom of movement, just like Attila the Hun did not fear it back in 1955. Although you had leaders of, of, of big Caribbean territories who were mortally afraid of it, so afraid of it that they destroyed the Federation on the basis of that. And you know, you know the irony, Julian? Traditionally, Jamaica, you know, the bigger territories were the ones most diffident about freedom of movement because the idea back then in the Federation days was that all of these small islanders will flood um, Jamaica. You know, that, that was the thinking then. But you, you know something? Fast forward a few decades. Right now, um, probably the, the migrants most to be found across the Caribbean, moving across the Caribbean, are Jamaicans. In fact, the, 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 the traditional thinking was that the small, lesser developed countries would be the ones in favor of the freedom of movement. The, the bigger territories like Jamaica would be the ones against it. But you know what we are finding? You know, you know the two countries that recently have, have, have come to CARICOM and said, we, we want to opt out of um, the component of the Skills National Program that has to do with agricultural laborers uh, and, and um, household domest domestics. St. Kitts and Antigua. St. Kitts and Antigua. Um, they're the ones who have said, hold on, we don't want to go, we don't want to go um, this, this, um, this far. Um, how Jamaica is probably the only the, the only um, CARICOM country that is actually actually has the arrangements in place to certify to give the household domestics the the Caribbean vocational qualification that will permit them to move across the region. So when we look at this thing over time, um, when we look at this thing over time, there's a time when the more developed countries are saying. Um, we don't want too much of this freedom of movement. The lesser developed ones are saying, yes, we are the one. And then, and then it reverses, then it reverses in time. So I think we really have to make that conceptual breakthrough. We are one. We recognize that these, this is our family, our kith and kin, and we really, we really don't need to be afraid of our family. You know, Barbados, Barbados, has a, um, Barbados is undergoing a demographic survey now. Because the government of Barbados feels that our that our population is too small for our developmental needs, and we are working on a on a population policy. But the thinking is that if we need to increase the population size, the first the first people we want to go to are our Caribbean brothers and sisters because they're kith and kin. They're they're just they're just like um like us. So we have to make that conceptual breakthrough to recognize our kith and kin. And, and secondly, we have to make that conceptual breakthrough in our economic thinking 
where we just as how we see movement of capital as being fundamental to, to economic development, that we see movement of workers, of people in the same light, something that is good and something um, not to be feared. Thank you, Ambassador. I want to go to a related element here because I've got a question uh, from one of the viewers who says, look, regional integration in the context of freedom of movement is being too over-regulated uh, with uh, the exception of a couple uh, who don't want technocrats to control their policy and sovereignty. But the key question here I want to pose to Gladys is there would never be any real integration unless all of the country become members of the CCJ. How are you going to get the delinquents to join? Is that critical for the success of the CSME? Well, um, let me just say, Julian, first that all of the countries <laughs> are part of the CCJ when it comes to the revised Treaty of Chagaramas. And therefore, that is not an issue. Um, Jimmy, you, you will have countries that do not use the Caribbean Court of Justice as their final court of appeal that still have gone before the CCJ. Um, Trinidad and Tobago has been before the CCJ as a defendant. Um, and Trinidad and Tobago does not have the CCJ as its final court of appeal. Jamaica has gone in the case where it intervened in Shanique Mairi against Barbados and also has not, does not have it as, the Caribbean, as its final court of appeal. So there's a distinction between the original jurisdiction of the Caribbean Court of Justice that all countries have already become a party to and the um, appellate jurisdiction that we only have four countries that are participating in. So the CCJ does have, have a critical role to play and it has. As, we, as I started saying earlier, it has in terms of um, setting out some basic rules, some guidelines, some um, its interpretation and its application of um, the, the various provisions of the treaty and the decisions of the court, uh, the decisions of the, of the conference and other organs. So, um, and, and to such a point, I mean, there's some matters that would have been before the court that would not necessarily be um, complete public knowledge, but there have been cases where we've had to go and explain the, the skills regime. And I, and I just wanted to touch on a point that was raised by Ambassador in terms of countries that have had derogations um, from the movement under the CARICOM skills regime. And to indicate that Antigua and Barbuda does have a, have a um, derogation in relation to non-graduate nurses and teachers. And recently, along with St. Kitts and Nevis, would have um, gotten a derogation for a period of time in relation to agricultural workers and security guards. Those would have been the two most recent decisions. Um, Antigua and Barbuda would have had a previous derogation in relation to the movement of household domestics, but that has been lifted. And, and we have gotten um, guidance from the court, even in relation to an advisory opinion that we sought, where the court would have given guidance on how we manage um, the opt-outs and how we and how we and whether and how opt-outs from a decision are to be interpreted in terms of a member state opting out of obligations and not and not um, not not of rights um, because the treaty does not say that. So so we have gotten considerable guidance from the court. We may not agree with uh, the member. Some member states may not agree with everything that the court has said. Some um, persons may not agree with everything that the court has said, but that is our court that is final and that has exclusive jurisdiction um, over matters relating to the revised treaty of Chagaramas, and that all countries agreed would do so. So the revised treaty actually has it as uh, um, and speaks to the exclusive jurisdiction of the court to interpret and apply the revised treaty and um, our and all of our countries have implemented legislation in relation to the Caribbean Court of Justice in its original jurisdiction. Why don't we model our system after the EU? Namely, once uh, you have an EU passport, you can travel without let or hindrance and take up employment. Is that the way it's supposed to work, Titus? I love this question. <laughs> yes, Julia, that's how it is supposed to work. 
truth, then the truth of the matter is, and you know, when I listen to Ambassador Commission, he he speaks, well, he's the politician here, so he has to, he speaks like that. But really and truly, if I am a CARICOM national, and I happen to have a place of abode in a member state, I, I have a, an electricity bill, I have a telephone landline bill, and I move to another member state of CARICOM. Why should I, in the opening of a bank account, why should I have to produce an electricity bill and, uh, and, and, and a water bill from that member state? It, it means we're still not treating ourselves as CARICOM nationals. We, we in, in the exercise of the process of being and moving freely, we have to reach the point where once you have established you are a CARICOM national, then all the privileges, rights, and processes that one would have uh, benefited from in the country, well, that a national in a country that you, you moved to would have benefited from, it ought to travel with you. So this is really where we are supposed to get to when we talk about free freedom of movement of people in a single economic space. So we don't have to go proving over and over that we we are a national of one of of multiple member states, so that we could benefit in the member state we've moved into. Once we are able to establish our credentials, bona fides as belonging to the community, then it should move across all member states of the community, which is what your question, Julian, is about in terms of should we have a system akin or along the lines of the EU. That is really where the goal should be. The, and and, and we, have, we are not there. We are not there. In, in fact, you, you look around and you see that the members of CARICOM that have moved into freedom of movement of people are the group of member states called the OECS. They have moved in that direction long ago. Uh, what were the lessons we learned from that? We saw no mass migration. In fact, I, I, I am, before having the, 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 the sight of the data before me, but my knowledge of the region tells me that there has been no mass movement of anyone. No, none of those economies have been overwhelmed. In fact, I think it is fair to say that the members are, are seeking to encourage more movement for greater for, uh, for greater um, cross fertilization of business ideas, for the building of trusts among each other so that they could enter into joint venture arrangements and businesses. That's what we are, we are hoping we can get to um, very soon and where we should be if we are to transform the economies of this region. And I'll, I'll, I'll stay with you because I'm, I'm not sure whether I should give Gladys this one quickly though. Is a CSME certificate obtained in one country valid and acceptable in another country? Well, the, yes. answer, the short answer oh. is yes, but that is could elaborate. Right. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, um, the, the heads long ago agreed that a certificate issued in one country should be um, recognized by another country. And in fact, most countries are doing that and as i said to you, as i said earlier i mean there is there is work to go in terms of not just simplifying the procedures but in terms of the countries some countries have not fully implemented the decision but the single certificate is is the way it is the the the, the heads would have said so as i indicated earlier the countries do have a right when a person presents the certificate to verify the certificate and the, and the um, documentation upon which the certificate was issued. But any such verification is to be done contacting the issuing authority, um, that it, the, issuing, the issuing authority, not through making a community national go through another application process. And that is something that we are working closely with the member states on. Um, it is something that I think the, you know, once you put in a procedure, sometimes it's hard to let that that um, administrative procedure go. But 
it is it is being it, that is certainly the the rule of the rule that's that's a rule um, and I should also indicate when there was a discussion earlier in terms of um, the single market of course it's going to be um, a work in progress in the sense that um, just like with any any country and any regular market and the market forces you do have to to have um, further development and reform of your laws as, as time goes by. And that's exactly what is happening here, where we did have procedures put in place, but there's a recognition that we do have to simplify them um, to make it easier for persons to access their rights. And um, the other point that I'd like to raise is to make it clear that while you have a skills regime that is um, incremental so to speak and when we spoke when i spoke to the categories it's already quite wide but while you have that skills regime you do also have the movement of service providers and that's in all areas and you also have the right to establish and that includes not just a company but a self-employed person and so the the extent to which we have already opened up in terms of freedom of movement is quite large and it is important that um, we get that message out there and we continue to get that message out there. We have done a, a number of public education programs over the years to do that, including having tertiary student exchanges um, from member state, from various member states um, to other member states. We have had um, public awareness activities, training activities with in, um, immigration officers, town halls, national and regional town halls, to get the message out there. Um, and most recently, we would have done a pilot where we had teachers in um, Belize and in Guyana teaching classes, joint classes, Belize and Guyana virtually um, on CARICOM and the CSME. And I can tell you, I, I joined at least one of those sessions and learned a lot, not just in terms of the what was being what was being said i mean it was it was we we talk about caricom and the csme a lot but at, at the same time it was in terms of even method of delivery and i would you know it's one of the things we have already identified that some of these teachers need to be some of our spokespersons going forward in terms of how ma how they manage to get the message across and the information and we're certainly targeting youth consumers private sector, um, labor in terms of getting the message across of what it is that, that the single market is about. As a, as a consumer, you, you, you're supposed to be able to consume services throughout the region as well. Over to you, Julia. It would seem, yeah, let me, let, let me ask uh, Professor Bradford to come in here because it would seem based on a question that just came in, um, is the onus on the ordinary citizens the media and so on to force member governments to fully implement CSME. I mean, if, if people think that is the problem, we have a problem, George. That is an excellent question. The way you phrased it, my, my philosophical background actually tells me, yes, Move, we started, we started, um, we proceeded on CSME in terms of a top-down approach, where we put faith in our and the political representatives to carry forward and advance the CSME and all those things that would be necessary. But as Titus would have alluded to previously, there is a stronger sense, and this is it comes back to the whole sense of when I used Barra and talk, spoke about the collective wisdom. The collective wisdom suggests that the real inertia and kinetics and, and, and momentum really springs from the bottom. And anytime you're trying to go too fast and the people at the bottom are not with you, you're going to run aground. And I do not think CSME or the CARICOM has run aground. But what I am suggesting and based on the question, this is a time for listening. This is a time for understanding, particularly from those persons. And indeed, I would like to encourage the, the CSME unit and CARICOM as a whole and the member states to start interviewing and collect 
collecting stories of the experiences, particularly of those persons who would not normally have moved because we know the first five categories represented the smallest margin of the collective in the region. But those were the ones that had that privilege early on. But what has happened since? And we need to get these stories and we need to package them because at the end of the day, it is the sentiments, it is the emotion, it is the capacity to network within your families in and across the region that really makes the difference in how people will accept and will be incentivized to use the freedom of movement as a people to enlarge this CARICOM and make it much stronger than it is currently. We have the capabilities. We cannot allow self-doubt to negate us from integrated development. So in the context of your question, and certainly from a, 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 a philosophical grounding, and the, the, the whole notion of brothers and sisters and the common destiny and the shared problems, problems, the history of colonialism. And, you know, we speak about institutions and processes. I think it was mentioned by Ambassador Commission and a question, one of the earlier questions that actually came in um, advance the view, but the reality is prior to the institutionalization of these things, it, there was a lot of movement across this region without the papers because we were all under one, one colonizer and there was that movement and people were allowed to, 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 to nearly um, engage in commercial activities. We have instrument, in, instrumentalized it in terms of being able to manage migration and manage these activities, because we know there are other elements, several of them exogenous, but some of them in, in endogenous, where there are forces of graft. And it is those types of things that forced us to want to manage the process. And in attempting to manage the process, we must not allow ourselves to put up these restrictions and prohibitive factors that do not allow the natural potential and energies of the people of the region, particularly what we so-called the ordinary people, to be able to help us to reach a stage of optimality and, and the essence that we can grow and be much stronger as one single domestic space. I'm going to bring back the ambassador here and, uh, and give him a chance to respond to you, George. But I want to frame it this way. Ambassador, mm -hmm. is the problem the brand that we're trying to sell? Uh, because maybe we have too many brands and people don't, don't, don't quite understand which brand belongs to where or that there is one brand, but we don't understand it's one brand. Um. The problem is, to some extent, that we have not done a very good job at educating our people about CARICOM, uh, you know, and, and this whole um, integration movement. Yes, we do have a problem. We, we do have a problem where we have had this implementation deficit sometimes, where political leaders have not really carried out their responsibility, have sat down on things. However, that definitely is not the, is not the case now. We do have a lot of dynamic leadership um, within CARI, political leadership within CARICOM right now, um, really uh, bringing a sense of urgency and getting things done. But we have not done a very good job. You know, there are, lot, there are lots of people who believe that CARICOM is the secretariat in Guyana. They don't have an understanding that CARICOM is all of us, it's, it's, it's the member states, it's the people. There are 17 CARICOM institutions carrying, carrying out a whole range of very important activities. I mean, you know, from, from the Caribbean Public Health Agency that has been so critical in dealing with COVID-19 to CXC to, you know, um, climate, the climate change, the renewable energy, you can go on and on. And then there are eight associate institutions 
that are so critical, the University of the West Indies, um, the Caribbean Development Bank. But, and then we have, we have other entities um, like Carifesta, the arts, the regional arts festival, or you could even see the, the, the West Indies cricket team as an, an, uh, as an associate institution of, of, of CARICOM. But a lot of our people don't see this. First of all, we haven't done a very good job at even educating our people about the institutions, what they are, what they do. We have about, we have about seven or eight CARICOM institutions right here in Barbados headquartered right here in Barbados. A lot of Barbadians are not, are, are not even aware. So we have done, we have done ourselves a, a, a disservice by not sufficiently promoting and educating our people about this integration institution, which in my opinion is perhaps, if, if worldwide, is perhaps second only to the European Union in terms of its success. It's longevity. Um, I mean, we go way back to 1968, if, if we trace our beginnings um, to Carifta. Um, so in terms of its longevity, we have never had a member state pulling out of, of CARICOM like Britain pulled out of, the, out of the European Union. So, but within a global context, CARICOM has been a relatively successful regional integration um, mechanism. We haven't sufficiently told that story to our people. Secondly, we have not, and, and, and this, this is connected to that, we have not done enough to root CARICOM in our people. And, uh, and we have to make that effort. I, I'm, I can tell you that we are, we are trying to do it in Barbados. You know, we are trying, Cari the Secretariat has told member states, look, you have to set up um, consultative mechanisms. You have to set up interministerial um, consultative mechanisms. You have to also <coughs> set up consultative mechanisms with your civil society, your private sector, um, your labor movement. And, and, and we need to do those things because it is through doing those things that we're gonna root CARICOM in, in the people. We, right now, at the secretariat level and member state level, we are working on um, beefing up the, the, the news and mass communication capacity of the secretariat. And hopefully soon from now, you're going to, you're going to see a lot more in terms of sharing information and news stories um, right, right, right across the region. But, but yes, these are things that we, that we, can, that we need to do, we have to do, because CARICOM is too important. It is too important to us, to our region, and, and um, we, we have to make it work. We, we are living in a world where we don't have many friends. It's a very hostile world. This is our mechanism for collective security and collective development. We have to give it more firmly to our people, and all, all of us together, we have to make it work. We've been talking a lot uh, uh, about, in, in, a, in a lot of ways, we've talked about of individual people. I want to spend a little time looking at the prospects for business and the, the movement and, uh, of, 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 of businesses, etc., uh, mergers, acquisitions, that kind of thing. Let me ask Gladys Young to zero in on that. And uh, a question was raised, which you can answer, really, about the matter of double taxation. Yes, um, thank you. Thank you for that, Julian. We do have a CARICOM agreement on double taxation. Um, it's a very long title, so I won't get into that. But we do already have an agreement from 1994 dealing with double taxation arrangements. And um, it, is, it is an agreement that there is some work that we are doing now to bring it up to um, well, it, as I said, from 1994, a lot has happened in terms of the tax lands, landscape. And so there are some matters that are being addressed to um, amend the agreement and to bring it in line with some of the uh, international arrangements and, and, and um, internationally led push in relation to taxation. But speaking generally to business, and as, as I said, we were speaking already on the right of establishment 
and the fact that it is for companies and also for individuals in terms of self-employed to establish businesses in the, in the region, in any member state, and to, to provide goods and services. And in that, we have done, um, we are doing considerable work in relation to harmonizing the laws and the, and the procedures in relation to the right of establishment and to companies generally. We are also pursuing initiatives, and I'm sure Titus can jump in at some point, um, to further in relation to the, the mergers and acquisitions. Well, mergers and acquisitions come naturally in the, in the course of business activity, but certainly once, once you also have mergers and acquisitions and in a, in a regime where you have sought to, to remove certain barriers and to eliminate, certain re, um, to eliminate some restrictions, you do not want that to then be put aside or done away with by companies' behavior in relation to anti-competitive practices or abuse of a dominant position. So we certainly are in that, we, we already have some of that addressed in the treaty and we are working on um, including in the treaty arrangements and the um, re mechanisms to deal with mergers and acquisitions um, in terms of notification to the competition authority but also, or I should say, notification requirements so that the competition authority can be aware of those um, mergers and acquisitions that may have an impact in terms of um, uh, creating a dominant position in the single market and economy. And therefore, from moving from that, um, being able to address um, any sort of well, well, being able to, to put in place certain, certain requirements. And we, we do have the policy being developed and dis being discussed with a wide range of stakeholders, including private sector, because obviously this would impact um, private sector greatly. In terms of the, uh, the other aspects, we have, in fact, created a public procurement regime. Well, I should say, um, uh, protocol dealing with public procurement to allow for, um, to open up the market access in relation to community nationals in one member state being able to, um, to being able to, to tender and, and um, benefit and, and get certain rights in relation to public procurement opportunities in other member states. And in fact, one of the key provisions of that is that um, for, for public procurement activities, where a member state is going to re reserve um, public procurement activities for nationals, it would do so for nationals, including nationals in other CARICOM member states. Um, and I should note though that we did, based on member states, some member states' concerns in relation to being able to, to give an avenue for small and medium-sized businesses to, to benefit and also in relation to particular activities. We did put certain carve-outs in terms of threshold amounts and in terms of um, particular activities that are reserved, um, that are not included in the, in the protocol. But there are a lot of aspects that we are working on for business and for business activity to, to ensure that we are, um, we are making it um, more open and more accessible. And I should indicate that there is also work being done in the services area because of course companies would also be providing services and, and, and individuals and that um, work is being done in terms of even how you deal with recognition of services um, and and ensuring that a, 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 if you are established, if you are a service provider in one area, um, a professional in terms of accounting or um, other professions, that you would be able to, that that recognition should um, be able to, to be utilized in the other member states. And so there is work being done in terms of a professional services 
bill, as well as um, advancing the services strategy. Let me, in the remaining minutes I have, I want to ask Titus to respond to a question about immigration. Somebody suggested that it would appear that a lot of immigration officers don't live up to the letter of the law regarding CSME. Well, yes, um, we have some some deviations from the established protocol from time to time. And some of this, um, Julian, also has to do with um, uh, the, the, the literal changing of the guard, as it were, in member states with um, officials who serve in that role at the border. And um, the need for training, constant training of officials, um, immigration officials, customs officials, that's, that is very important. And we would have had in our program, our work program for this year, um, and last year, in fact, to undertake uh, training, but COVID um, would have dampened our efforts in that regard. We're still trying to have these things done virtually, of course. Uh, but you would get from time to time um, deviations. Um, sometimes individuals have their own interpretation of things, but we have recourse. Uh, you have the right to exercise a complaint at every point of entry, especially at the airports, member states ought to have put in place and most member states have done that um, a complaints procedure that can be um that can be uh, initiated by the person who is aggrieved so we, we we are in fact um we have a mechanism to handle that uh, and since i have the floor quickly george um quickly quickly brother rogers i would just say that in in relation to companies we are um looking at uh, finalizing the fiscal incentive regime, a harmonized fiscal incentive regime for businesses, uh, a CARICOM financial services agreement, and an investment uh, agreement also. And these are all tools we are putting in place for um, the business component of um, um, our activities within movement in the CSME. I got one minute left, and I'm going to give it to, uh, to, to Professor Braffitt because it was his passion that. Uh, really struck home uh, in his first uh, uh, intervention. George, you got a minute. Okay. Um, in wrapping up, what I am going to really call for is to reflect on the collective consciousness and the fact that we are building institutions and all these institutions carry processes within them that need our help, our input, and the political will. With that being said, I want to see more cooperation and collaboration, not only at the level of the minist interministerial, but with the stakeholders and the civil society, as, as noted, and then carry that across to member states so that that greater collaboration is conducive to further cooperation. And it is with those things that even when things may not, we may not agree, it is out of speaking about the conflicts that we can gain that consensus necessary to advance the region and with a people-centered development and noting that it is about integrated development and we must bring in the media the media has a responsibility in terms of accurate reporting and we have the re we have within the context of csme and caricom they have a duty to ensure that there is ample information there that can be shared on every platform, whether it's Facebook, regardless, wherever it is, but it must be shared. And we have, and in sharing that, we also have to expose and divulge some of the experiences of persons across this region who would have benefited and who would have exercised their rights and obligations in, in relation to the whole movement. With that said, I think this was a wonderful panel, quite insightful. I learned a lot, and I'm sure the region has learned and will be calling for much more of it. I thank you. And I thank you, Professor, and I thank the other members of the panel for joining us and helping us explore this particular uh, very, very important subject area. Thanks to you. Thanks, of course, to Impact Justice, and thanks to our partners here at UETV Global. I'm Julian Rogers in Kingston for the Caribbean community.